What is up? Welcome back to a new episode of the 4 Men Podcast. My guest today, his name is Mike Fisher. Mike is an uh, awesome man. If you do not know him, he is um, an ex-former uh, hockey player, and he's just an amazing dude. He's a husband, a father. He's the co-founder of the Lifestyle Brand Catch and Deers, and he's also a, a, a musician. So, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for having me, buddy. Man, your your, your music video amazed. I I, um, I just feel like I had to put that in the intro because oh. I feel like you. I feel like a lot of time and effort went into making it, and it was actually really good. You ha- you have a really good voice. I don't know how much of that was auto tune in your voice, but uh, I didn't know what Carrie would think about me putting musician in your uh in your bio. I was wondering where you're going with that, but man, if you know me and most people, are like I can't believe you did that. But it was like, the guys were like, no, this has got to be you. And I was like, oh, man, I might have to take one for the team. And I got to get after it if I'm going to do it. So, but there's a little bit, little bit of attitude in there. Well, it's funny. When I met you, when I met you in Jackson Hole, you were like, you know, kind of more requ- quiet, reserved, a little too much, a little more to yourself. And then I saw you in that music video and I was like, this just seems like a completely different person. Yeah, exactly. That was out of my comfort zone. That's for sure. But, um, Tried to have fun with it and uh, got in the studio. I remember the day I was going to the studio. I, w- you know, I, we're, I was talking before I was leaving, and Carrie's like, "Where are you going?" I was like, "Actually, I'm going into the studio to record." She looked at me like, "No, you're not." <laughs> but the guy in the in the studio said it's not the worst voice he's heard. Yeah. So I was like, "Well, I guess that's a compliment." He didn't say it was great, <laughs> but what would she have thought if it just happened to go like super super viral? And like it had more listens than one of her songs or something. Well, the so before the other one I did before he, before she bleeds, um, it it actually did pretty good. And she yeah. like I did she didn't think I was gonna do it, and then I don't think she really liked it <laughs> when I did it. It's kind of making fun of one of her songs. Yeah, but it actually got quite a bit of views, and it had over a million views pretty early. So I told oh her, you know, I was like, yeah, I will, I guess I went platinum. You know. <laughs> That is so funny. Yeah. I would have, I would have loved to have heard that conversation in y'all's house of, yeah. of you going to the studio and record. And yeah, I heard you say that you had a song dropping on Friday or something like that, and, and she was not appreciating the lingo. No. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god, that's so funny. Man, well, y'all live in, uh, <clears throat> y'all live in Tennessee now, and you grew up in Canada. Um, you know, and hockey was a huge part of of your life and your childhood. What uh, what was life like for you growing up in Canada? Well, I mean, my older brother, you know, he played hockey. So that was a big part of, you know, having an older brother that plays helps. And so I always just wanted to play, play hockey. We grew up, um, I grew up in a Christian family going to church and uh, that was an important part. Um, I love, we kind of lived out in the country, so I loved, you know, being outside and, um, you know, I always had my pellet gun and my, my goal or, uh, my, uh, Springer Spaniel that I'd go off in the woods by myself and, um, I just loved outdoors. My mom's side of the family were big outdoors people. And, um, so it was kind of a mix of, you know, church life and school and sports and outdoors. And, um, we lived in kind of a smaller town outside of Peterborough, Ontario, which is Northeast of Toronto. Um, uh, but I got two, two brothers and a sister and, um, that was kind of, he kind of, kind of our upbringing. So, um, but yeah, now Tennessee, Tennessee's home now. We we love it. So well, I know when you got drafted, um, this you got drafted in the second round. What uh, what year was that in? Nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight. That that was the year I was born. <laughs> I'm I'm not trying to make you feel old, but that was the year I was born. Yeah. Um, well, you know, yeah, you just kind of mentioned growing up in a Christian family. I was the same way. I grew up, um, going to church every Sunday. Then when I got to college, I kind of realized that maybe the way I'd been living wasn't actually, you know, representative of, um, of my faith. And I was, I was watching something where you were talking about, you know, the night that you got drafted, you, you really had this moment. What, um, you know, what was that moment like for you where, yes, you grew up as a Christian, but you really had this moment in your life where you were kind of confronted with, with some of the things that you were doing and you feel like that was a pivotal moment in your life. Yeah. So that was, um, 90, nine i guess it was uh the night the day i signed my contract so i i went back one year junior as an 18 year old after i was drafted and then came back and then i played um or then i tried out and and one of the, we had a holdout on our team our captain held out so that opened up a spot so i ended up making it i signed a contract 
you know, just a few days before um, we're start of season. So I wasn't really supposed to make it as a 19 year old, but, um, so anyways, I, um, yeah, the that night I signed a contract, went out and got drunk and made some bad decisions. And at that point, like I left when I was 17. So I left home to play junior hockey. So I left church, you know, our church family, um, my family influences and I was like on my own. So I struggled. I mean, I started drinking and, and doing things I knew that weren't right. And, um, so yeah, I, you know, that was kind of a culmination of a few years and, um, that, you know, uh, there's nothing like a Christian that knows the truth that's backsliding. I mean, you can imagine the guilt mm-hmm. and the shame and, um, of knowing like this isn't the way, but as a 19 year old, it's like, it's hard to put, you know, I was, you know, when I signed that contract, it was for quite a bit of money for at that time. And for me anyway, and it was like, holy cow, trying to juggle all these plates and not having a firm, solid, um, you know, I, I believed in Christ, but I, I, I don't know that I was, I definitely wasn't spirit filled at that point. So that changed a few years later. Um, when I started a Bible study with my cousin, um, and, we just went through some of the sin issues that I've been dealing with and, you know, repented and, you know, recommitted my life to the Lord. And then I was baptized recently after, but that's when the first time in my life where I felt the Holy spirit was about 22 years old, but it was all these things that I was, you know, I knew the right thing to do, but, um, I just, you know, was stuck in that sin and being around the wrong influences. And, but once you, once I did that, it def- that, that changed my life for sure. That's really powerful. Do you feel like there was a, was there a moment where, maybe not a moment, but do you feel like kind of that life change, how did you maybe approach hockey different after that? You know, going being in June, um, you know, kind of what you just talked about when you were 17 and playing junior hockey to getting drafted and also, yes, being a Christian, but then kind of, you know, backsliding like you mentioned and then becoming spirit-filled. How did you approach like did the way that you approach hockey and, you know, competition and, and all those things kind of change having that different mindset? Yeah. I mean, immediately. So hockey became my God. I mean, it really was. And that was everything I was chasing. So when, you know, when I committed my life to the Lord at 22, it was like, okay, it was pretty, pretty soon after right away. It was like, okay, I, God's given me this talent and ability I got to use it. Uh, you know, I, I want to use it for him and that's why I'm here. I've learned a lot. I've learned what not to do. And, you know, and this is, I want to live my life for him and give him the glory because he, you know, obviously he gave me the gift. And, um, so that just, it changed my perspective really for sure on, on where I was and why he'd given me the ability and, and I needed to, to try to be a good example and, um, in the locker room and, in and, and, all areas of my life and um made me appreciate the game probably a little bit more um especially yeah, i went through a lot of injuries early in my career too i mean i had surgery after surgery but by the end of my career it was like i could relate to you know i could pretty much pretty much diagnose players <laughs> teammates so like what do you feel and oh, i i mcl for sure <laughs> yeah but you know, as hard as those times are, it's like God uses those and to help others and, you know, uh, in all areas of our life. But, um, it definitely changed my perspective. Didn't mean I didn't, you know, struggle or make mistakes along the way, but, um, but it was, you know, definitely a, a huge, huge, uh, perspective change for me. That's awesome. Do you have any cool stories of, you know, maybe witnessing to a teammate, Playing hockey because I know I've only been to one hockey game. I, I honestly don't know much about hockey, mm-hmm. but I went to a, a Tampa Bay Lightning game and there was like three fights. Which I know a lot of people go to hockey games because they kind of hope, you know, they hope for some kind of knockdown, n- knockdown drag out fight. Um, but I know most sport, you know, most professional sports by and large are just, you know, more of a secular environment. Um, so how do you feel like when you're able to stay grounded, you know, at being 22 years old playing a professional sport? Um, how do you feel like you're able to stay grounded? And also, yeah, do you have any cool stories or moments where you're, you're able to witness to a teammate? Yeah. Um, uh, grounded, I think, um, you know, God put my cousin in my life who I was living with at that time where that's how it helped me coach me through those things. And, um, so I, I had him and then God just seemed to put the right people in place at the right time that 
would encourage me. I've got some great mentors. I look back now, I'm like, holy cow. Cause, and I, it's scary to think about where I'd be without the Lord, honestly. And that's what yeah. happens to a lot of players, you know, and honestly, the difference is the Lord. And he puts really good people in my life. I had a couple of Christian teammates that were, that were really influential to me too. And, um, but, um, yeah, so the second part, um, but I've got a few cool stories. So, and sometimes it, it's it's amazing. Sometimes I look back and I'm like, man, I remember going through times where it's like, man, I've, uh, like God, am I am I making a difference? Like, am I mm-hmm. am I really a good teammate? You know, and I always try to, I wouldn't shy away from my faith, but I wasn't overly outspoken. People knew I was a believer and tried to live the right way and, and influence and encourage guys. And, um, but you know, sometimes it. You know, I had stories of guys coming to know the Lord after, even through other chaplains that I know that hopefully impacted positively. Um, two years ago, I was able to lead a former teammate to the Lord on our lake here at our farm, which is probably, which is one of the coolest moments. That's awesome. In a, in a boat, you know, on our lake, which was pretty amazing, a former teammate. And then um, last summer, I was able to baptize another former teammate at a, I don't know if you've heard of PAO, Professional Athletes mm-hmm. Outreach. Yeah. Um, so we started hockey about four years ago. So um, I had a teammate that came to know the Lord that I knew. I mean, I knew God was working his life for a few years. And um, so he accepted the Lord and I was able to baptize him last summer, which was pretty amazing. Um, you know, which, you know, I made a lot of mistakes early in my career. And I'm like, man, like, whoa, you know, what was I doing? But God just, you know, he can, he can work through it all. And, um, you know, those are a couple stories that are highlights that, you know, look back, it's only, it's, it's all really because of him and just trying to, um, live a life that honors him and, and be in the right moment and kind of keep your eyes and ears open to, to what God's doing and be available. So, yeah, that's so powerful, man. I love, I love, um, like that this the illustration of you leading someone to Christ on a boat is just so like yeah. just the imagery on that is just so <laughs> it's so powerful. I love that. Yeah, yeah, it was that was pretty awesome. Yeah. So being in the summer here in Louisiana and also just now having our second daughter, I'm not working out as much as I would like, which means that I'm not able to be as maybe healthy as I've been in the past, which is why I love to drink my AG1. I feel like it's also just supplemented uh, the health that I've needed this summer, taking some time off the gym. I drink AG1 literally every morning, and it's a daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. And I gave AG1 a try because I wanted better gut health. I wanted increased immunity support. I don't like taking pills and vitamins, and I wanted a supplement that actually takes tastes great. When I drink it, it's super smooth and it goes down easy and and it does not hurt my stomach. And like I said, I drink it in the morning. I like to typically drink it before I work out and before I get my day started. And it makes me feel like I'm ready to take on the day. And it makes me just feel like I'm giving something good to my body. And it's the nutrition that it deserves. And I'm covering all the bases that I need for the day for my health. And AG1 was designed with ease in mind so that you can live healthier and better without having to do a lot. It's seriously the healthiest thing that you can do in just under a minute. So why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder and water once a day? And every scoop of AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients of high quality that give me major benefits like gut and mood support, boost of energy, and even healthier looking hair, skin, and nails. There were so many things that it benefited in my uh, lifestyle. It really did help improve my digestion, and I feel like it helped support my sleep. It, it may be, be in better moods, and I also even just feel like it helped with my recovery from uh, the strenuous workouts that I had been doing. And like I said, it's the summer here, and we have not been traveling much this summer, but our fall is about to really pick up, and I'm super excited to take my travel packs with me. I travel everywhere with my AG1 travel packs because I know that I need nutrition on the go. Most places we go do not have the healthiest options, and if I know that if I can have these travel packs with me, it's going to give me the uh, nutrients that I need for the day no matter where I go. And since you have heard me last talk about AG1 on my podcast, since then I've gotten my sister-in-law on AG1 and I've also got my cousin on AG1. And those are just a few of the people that in the past I've gotten on like my parents, my uh co-workers even here in the duck commander office and my neighbor that I always used to talk about where where we live here in town. So if you want to take ownership over your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash huff 
That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Go check it out. You played hockey for professional hockey for how many years? I played 18 years uh, in the NHL. So that is quite a few. I, yeah. Yep. Okay. No. Well, well, <laughs> first off, that's crazy. Um, what, um, you know, because I know that you played in Canada for a while and then you ended up playing in Nashville. Uh, what, what stage were you at when you, um, when you met your wife mm-hmm. and what's kind of the, what's kind of your backstory um, with meeting Terry? Yeah. So I, I played Ottawa almost 11 years, I guess. And I guess it was 2008, 2008. Yeah. So one of my mentors, his name's Tim Burke. He, um, He's a, a great friend, and he knew Carrie's uh, band leader. So I just remember one night he's like, oh, "If you ever want to meet Carrie, let me know." And I was kind of like, uh, "You know, but uh, you know, she'd come to a show in Ottawa, and I didn't, I didn't end up going because I was like, uh, you know, probably n- nothing happened anyway, you know." And then he a- he had asked again, I believe, not too f- far long, you know, not that much farther after, and I was like, "Ah, maybe." So then I drove, so she knew I was coming to the show and uh, I'll try to make this quick enough, but it's kind of a funny story. So if you, no, my wife, if you yeah. so I was going to come to the show and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get backstage, you know, like I'm going to be, you know, well, I, I get to the show and I say, I had a marker band later and he's like, yeah, well, uh, you're going to have to go through meet and greet with all the young kids. So her thought was, well, if he's weird and I don't like him, I'm not, I don't have to deal with him backstage so let's put them through meet and greet as a filter <laughs> that's actually really smart so i it, it is so i i go through meet and greet and i'm trying to get to the back of the line like there's a bunch of little girls in their line and i'm like there with with a buddy of mine so but anyways so we met talked for a few minutes and then um her and uh most of her band we just went out after um for some something to eat exchange numbers and then we really didn't have our first date date till a few months after that. So, um, where she says she invited herself to Canada. So <laughs> well, I'm just picturing, cause but, you know, Sadie, Sadie does a lot of meet and greet lights too. uh, meet and greet lines. I'm just in my head, I'm picturing like all these 12 to 14 year old girls. And then you're just like in the middle <laughs> of them. <laughs> yeah. It was, I was like, Oh my goodness. I can't believe she made me do this. But anyway, it was, it was a, humbling moment you know <laughs> yeah uh, so we yeah we dated for a year and a half and then we're married and then um married in 2010 uh, july of 2010 and uh we'd really only gone back and forth you know she was obviously living in nashville and i was living in ottawa so it was kind of like you know long distance dating but we were still married and then two and then 2011 in february uh, i got traded to nashville and i'd never asked for a trade and uh but um, Nashville, I guess, wanted me there, and um, it's it's amazing how God kind of worked that together. My mom actually called it. She told my dad two weeks before the trade, which they didn't. I wasn't expected to be traded, and she's like, "Maybe this is because I was having a really bad year. Our team was having a bad year. We'd lost eleven in a row." And uh, so she was talking to my dad in the, in the kitchen one night. She's like, "Well, maybe this is God's way of having Mike be traded to go be with Carrie." And it ha- two weeks later, it happened. Like no one called it, but wow. that's just that's just my mom. But so, but the owner called me after the trade and was like, "Man, I just wanted you to go be with our wife. We're gonna rebuild our team." And I was like, "Man, that's that's awesome. It's a pretty good deal. That's really so, cool." So yeah, so I that's 2011 February, and then I spent about seven seven or so years here playing for the Predators. So so if you yeah. if you didn't get traded, was Carrie gonna move to Canada? No. <laughs> but so I was on a contract that probably was, I mean, pro- I think I had two or three years left on my deal, which in free agency, I probably would have tried to, um, sign with the Preds, but honestly, that's all we ever knew, you know, um, dating with going back and forth, get a day off. She'd fly in, fly out. I mean, it wasn't ideal, but it's what we kind of had to do. And, uh, I remember when I was traded, like there was a, there was a time where it was kind of an adjustment actually like living together more often than not. Like, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure I annoyed her (laughs) with all the things that I, you know, but it was, that was an adjustment period because you're actually together a lot more and it was outside of just, you know, day here and there dating. But uh, no, cause me and Sadie were similar, man. We, we dated long distance for a year and then we were engaged long distance for like six months, got married in November 
and then COVID happened in March. So we were quarantined together after <laughs> after dating long di- after being you know long distance for like like two years or maybe a little over. And it was really an adjustment. We had so many just little stupid arguments at the beginning of just, yeah, we went from seeing each other, you know, once a week, every other week to literally not leaving the house together for however, whatever, whatever that was like a year. Uh, yeah, it was definitely an adjustment. So we, we, we were similar. Like, how do you date long distance? And you just, yeah, now, now you start living together and you, you see, uh, you see all the things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a bit of a slow learner. So after 13 years of marriage, I'm still figuring stuff out. <laughs> and, but what, you know, if she's coming back off the road, it's like, okay, this house better be clean. I'm going to have a tidy. I'm like, but yeah, there's, it's, uh, yeah. And then you have kids, as you know, that changes oh, yeah. everything too. Oh, yeah. it's crazy. It's hard, but it's best, you know, but yeah. Yeah, kids are. Yeah, we just had our second. Um, I know. Two, Congre- two two months ago, and it's congrats. Thank you, man. It's it's yeah. uh it's awesome. But yeah, two two is definitely an adjustment. Um, it's 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 awesome. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely different than than just having one for sure. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to hear because I, I I I'm pretty sure this is a funny story. Um, what happened? Because I, I know that you you retired, and then um. Carrie might have said something to you, which kind of provoked you to kind of come out of retirement um, your first time. Do you have, what's your, um, what is that story? Well, yeah, I, so I retired in 2017. We actually went to the cup final and it, I'd kind of, I'd thought about retiring. You know, obviously we had a three-year-old at home at the time and Carrie's touring schedule and I'm playing and I was just like, man, this is hard. Like I remember one month that I didn't see my son. I put him to bed like, you know, maybe half a dozen times in a month. And I was like, this is, it's hard, you know? Yeah. So, so I retired. I felt like that's what, you know, I thought and prayed a lot about it. I was okay. Like, and got it kind of taken away my desire a little bit, you know? And so I retired, yeah, 2017. And then, um, um, yeah, I guess it was December of the next 17 that, so the Preds were having a great season. They were top of the league and, you know, I went in, our, the coach texted me. He was like, why don't you come in and see the guys, watch practice? And I was like, yeah, I probably should go in there, you know, check in. So then I, I went in and watched practice. They had the guys in the dressing room and the, and the coach, the lab you led at times, like, yeah, come in my office, you know, after you, before you leave. So I went in and he was like, hey, what, you, what did you think about coming back for uh, the next, you know, for the playoffs, end of the season? I was like, nope, not happening. And so he's like, okay, well, whatever you know and then so a couple months later he texts me again he's like we need to know by the end of i forget it was february or whatever if you want to come back and i was like so then i went home i you know i, I told carrie that there's still you know there's no no way i thought i ever would and then she's like well and she had done tour she finished touring we were home and uh she's like well why not and i was like oh, i just don't i, I don't want to and at that point, I wasn't training. I didn't work out. I needed a break, like uh-huh. mentally, physically, after years and years of training, and I needed a break. And uh, and I was like, wow, I got to get back training. I just don't. She's like, well, do you think you can do it? <laughs> that was. Well, yeah, well, no, well, well, well that was what I was saying because I want. I was watching something where you were saying, <laughs> yeah, you retired, and then she kind of like, well, I don't know what the time period after that was. She yeah. kind of made a jab at like questioning your physical ability yeah, to exactly. go back out and play yeah. and then and then you came back out of retirement yeah that's pretty much what it was she kind of was like uh oh, you know do you think you can do it and i was like yeah heck yeah i can do it that that, <laughs> that the, was all the motivation you needed the, the, so the next the first two weeks i mean holy cow it was i was like what am i doing i was so so out of shape and i had to skate and train team is you know travel on the road playing and i'm just training as hard as i can but after the first few weeks it wasn't too bad you know, your muscle memory, you get it back pretty quick. So I know many, um, you know, many professional athletes after they, you know, retire or an injury or, you know, what, whatever kind of prohibits them from, you know, continuing to play. So many of them struggle, you know, like you kind of mentioned earlier about finding, you know, your, maybe your identity in hockey or, you know, viewing hockey as a god. And I know so, so many people struggle with, you know, just for finding so much of your identity and what you've done for so long. How do you feel like, just where you were at in your relationship with, with God kind of helped you in that sense of retiring and not, you know, feeling like you have 
you know, your whole identity was, was in hockey. Yeah. So I, you know what, I always say, obviously faith and the Lord helps because that's your, your purpose. And, you know, that definitely helps. And that's, you know, where your identity is, but they're still living that out in a, in a way that's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to say that, but it, you know, to live it out is hard. Um, but I, I think I always say guys that have other passions outside of that sport too. I love to hunt and fish and I was looking forward to doing other things and dreaming about other things and, um, kind of what's next, you know, cause I mean, for 18 years, I mean, you're married to the game basically. It's even summer. I mean, you don't take a lot of time off and it's training and it's, you know, doing all these things and, you know, scheduling and your, your schedule's handed to you, you know, all the time. So I, I kind of was looking forward to it. Um, what I what I didn't know, which was a cha- you know, which was a bit of a transition, was you know I was getting calls from TV and other things, and the team here in, in Nashville, you know, offered me something you know hockey related, and I just I wanted to take time, you know, I wanted to take time to figure it out and see if there was, you know, still a desire for something inside hockey, and then I, I knew pretty quick that there there wasn't, you know. Um, especially with our family and, um, you know, so, but I guess that, I guess the hardest thing for me, honestly, in the transition, so I'm going from, okay, playing in the NHL, living out your dream. And like, really it's like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to make an impact positively for people. And it's like, you're in the spotlight. And then I go from that to like, okay, I'm, my wife's in the spotlight. I'm just home with my boys, you know? So there's a transition kind of, I'm not the main provider in the home and you know so there's working through those things too where it's like okay Mm -hmm. you know i just i had to kind of pray through a lot of things and be like okay i i gotta humble myself i want to be number one be a good dad i want to um support my wife and her career and you know may not be i never both of us really never cared for the spotlight anyway um so that wasn't a huge desire um but but i also loved you know, one thing I did, which helped a little bit transition, because the thing, biggest thing you miss too is like the camaraderie um, inside the locker room. So, uh, but I get that. I can get that at the hunt camp, you know, mm-hmm. and inviting buddies. And I mean, hunt camps like the locker room, it's cleaner, but, um, but it's, uh, I mean, just guys making fun and laughing, you know, that's, so I, I can still get part of that, you know, but in really just being around people you want to be around. And, and now I have the margin to kind of do, other things and you know kind of make my own schedule that was a weird thing making my own schedule deciding what i wanted to do and you know and having a focus on things that really mattered now for that purpose part of it you know it just made me think of it when you were talking i was thinking about this earlier i was like man me and me me and mike are kind of similar you know we um you know we're both two dudes that love sports we love to hunt we're married to you know, two well-known women. But then I was like, but then again, Mike was also a professional hockey player before Carrie. And I was like, I was just a college student. So I was like, we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of similar, but we're kind of also a little yeah, different. That's uh, similar. I was, I was yeah. like, oh, that's just funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're yeah. similar, but yeah, you, you were still a professional hockey player before. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little different. I was just, yeah. I was just in school at Auburn. Yeah. Well, I didn't go to school. So you're, you got, you're smarter than me for sure. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's yeah. funny. Well, yeah. you know, you mentioned earlier um, you have two sons, and I know um, you know how much being how, how important it is being being a father to you. And it's such a cool story. Um, you know, so you have two sons, Isaiah and Jacob. Um, but just the story of of your second son, Jacob, was just so powerful. I was I was um, just kind of watching and listening a little bit more of y'all's story um, this this past week. How do you feel like you know? Can you kind of maybe share briefly just just this? you know, the story of, uh, of your son, Jacob, and what have you learned from God, um, being in the valleys, you know, because mm-hmm. it's like you talked about where it's, 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 you know, it's easier to trust God when, when, th- when everything's going good. Um, and it's maybe a little more difficult when, when, when you're going through things that are difficult and you feel like you're in the valley. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. We, so we, so for Isaiah, I mean, we got pregnant pretty early. We decided we want to have kids. We got pregnant right away and everything was, you know, great. Um, and then we decided to have another child that it was a different story. Uh, we ended up having three miscarriages, which is really, which was tough. That was the Valley. Um, that was, that was hard. And so, um, 
after two miscarriages, I remember actually, I was, I remember exactly where I was, you know, just trying to work through, okay, God, you know, we really wanted Isaiah to have a sibling and, you know, in my mind, I'd wanted three or four, um, but yeah. Carrie, not probably not that many, but, um, but so, you know, it was hard. It's hard on, on her, you know, the emotions and really hard. And so, but, uh, I remember I was working out in our old house and, and, uh, a lot of times, I don't know if it's whatever, working out sometimes I feel like that's when God really speaks to me. It could be through, you know, whatever it is. But um, but I, I was, I think, stretching after workout, whatever, on a mat. And I was just kind of wrestling with God. I was just like, it was hard. And I was like, you know, why? And praying through that. And then I just felt him say, okay, you're going to have a son and it's going to be named, his, his name's going to be Jacob. And this is actually right when I was about to come back. I was training to come back that's when it was. And so a few days later, um, we have another miscarriage. So that was when she was pregnant, I I believe. So we have another miscarriage. I remember. So I went down after that. I heard, I was like, okay, we're going to have a son named Jacob. So I was like, okay, I got to go tell Carrie. Cause if not, I'm going to, in my mind say, no, that wasn't, no, no, no. So I went Mm -hmm. and I told Carrie, she's like, okay, that's awesome. You know? And then we have another miscarriage not long after. And I remember thinking like, am I, you know, and I remember Karen saying, she's like, we don't know God's timing. We don't know what is in the future. Don't, you know, you know, just keep believing. And, uh, so we, we'd been through a lot of, you know, we talked about, uh, IVF in vitro and we kind of didn't feel right about that. And we were talking through that and she'd been on some stuff to help her get pregnant. And then one night, um, she'd stopped going on those and uh she's like i can't deal with it i'm just i'm done you know i can't deal with the pressure of you know keep trying you know so what one, one night she went up to sleep with isaiah and she was she was at her wits end and and uh and that's when she she was oh no this is what happened sorry back up she was pregnant and then she thought she'd lost jacob or she thought she'd lost what ended up being jacob and uh she was going to see her doctor on monday and that night i think it was a sunday night She'd had all the signs that she'd lost another baby. So she'd had enough. And she, I remember she went up to lay with J, uh, Isaiah in the bed and she was, you know, crying and praying and just like, God, God, I can't do this anymore. Like, just shut the door if we're not, you know, goes to the doctor the next day and all her numbers were through the roof. Everything was great. He's like, no, you got, she's like, well, why was I, you know? And uh, so that was ended up being Jacob after three, three miscarriages. And we wow. named him Jacob, and uh, and and what I realized, and for a long time I didn't know why. I was like, well, I don't know why Jacob. I I really didn't know. I didn't. It wasn't like an. And then I was listening to a sermon one day, and I kind of felt dumb not putting it together before. And I was like, I I was wrestling with God, and Carrie was that night, and it was like this wrestle with God through all of it, and that's what happened with Jacob, right? He wrestled with the Lord until he got his blessing in the morning. And I kind of put all that together and I was late, but I was like, oh, that's why Jacob. So now it's a reminder, like just, you know, it's a reminder for us. Just keep trusting. You never know. And, uh, and then there was a sense, I remember writing down some stuff and then there was a sense of guilt too after it's like, well, we're giving God all the glory through this, but even if he didn't provide, he's still good, you know? So I was like a guilt. Well, it's not, we're telling a story. But even if we know he's still good regardless, you know, and, and we're, we're rejoicing for Jacob, we call him our miracle baby and, and we're grateful for it, but not just because he gave us what we want, but just because inherently he is good. And that's what we had. I wanted to, to make sure that regardless of the outcome, he's good because that's, you know, and he loves us, not just because we got what we wanted, you know, but it was a good reminder of that. So, yeah, well, so much of faith, you know. I feel like it's a wrestle every day, you know, like even, even you on the workout mat, you know, wrestling with that and you feeling like God's, God speaks that to you. Um, and then you can share it with Carrie, then you have another miscarriage. Then there's the wrestle aspect of, you know, you're wrestling with yourself of like, well, did I hear that correctly? Is that actually true? You know, so there's like, you're wrestling with God and, and, in, in, in all that, but then you're doubting, you know, you're doubting, did I just, you know, did I, conjure that up in my mind did did the lord really speak that to me so like there's so many different ins and outs of 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 just the wrestle and um yeah yeah that's really cool of of seeing the blessing you know come forth from um 
just from that time. And, and yeah, that, that, that's, it's really cool. Cause I know that y'all, y'all said Jacob was never, you know, a name that y'all had, that y'all had planned. Um, you know, just I mean, that story. Yeah. I'm really, really powerful. Talking to Carrie, but you know, we're going to have a son, his name's Jacob. And she's like, okay. <laughs> All right. Like, and it was not a name that we would have picked together, but that's just, you know, it's kind of a cool story, but really in all of it, you know, he's our miracle baby. We can tell people about it and, and, uh, you know, it's pretty faith building story. No question for us and our family. Man, that's just, yeah, I, that's just so powerful too. And even just hearing you, you know, on that back end of, cause I think, I think so, so often too, it's so much easier for us to say, you know, well, even if God didn't provide that, he's still good. And it's and so yeah. like, it's, I don't, I don't want to say it's easy to say that, but it's easier to say that than it is to truly believe it mm-hmm. than it is to like, you know, take it um, for what it is. Cause it is true. You know, even if God did not provide that um, he is still good, but it's, it's, it's so much easier to say that than to, you know, inherently believe it. Yeah. in your heart. Right. Yeah. And like, I, I say that to hope that even if I didn't, that I, you know, God was going to, work through it all in ways that we never know, you know, and, you know, it's not, yeah, it's, it's definitely easy to say. That's kind of, I was wrestling with a little bit of the guilt of telling the story even, you know, well, it's easy to say, cause you got your, well, we also did lose three babies too, you know, so that's, yeah. you know, that's not, that's not easy, you mm-hmm. know, and, uh, but, but yeah, that's just, just part of, part of life and learning and growing and, um, yeah. That's awesome. That's really powerful. How do you feel like, um, how do you feel like having God as your foundation in your marriage allows you and your wife to disagree on things? Because I know that there's probably plenty of things that you do that Carrie's not a huge fan of, and I'm sure there's things that Carrie um, enjoys doing maybe that you're not a fan of. How do you feel like having that foundation allows you to to disagree on things and uh, it not um, affect your marriage? Yeah, well, I'll say that without the Lord, I'd, uh, and then this, I guess a lot of people could say this, I don't know that we, you know, be married because, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're selfish enough as it is, you know, and then you, but the Lord has provided incredible, um, people in our lives and our marriages to encourage us to walk with. Um, it's, it hasn't, you know, we've, we've had a, a lot of good years. We've had bumps and, uh, learning moments. Um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I, I think the biggest thing we can do is put right people and learn from other people that are wiser than us. And, um, one of the, one of the things that, you know, we've disagreed on is the hunting thing. I mean, and she, you know, she, her dad's a hunter. She's never liked hunting and just can't actually can't stand it. And that's my, one of my favorite things to do. And it's like, God, what in the world? But he, I'll tell you what, he, God's work through it all. I mean, I, I'll try to make quick, but you know, there's one, one point for a few years in our marriage, I guess it was two years in our marriage where it was just, holy cow, like this is, we, and we don't, we're not big fighters. We don't, I mean, we would disagree, but, um, that was the one thing that was just like, we were button heads, you know? So I, I decided the one year, which I didn't hunt a lot during the season, but I told her, I was like, okay, hey, she needed to know that our marriage is more important than, um, hunting. So I told her I was going to, you know, this deer season, I'm not going to hunt while well, she could not believe it. And she, I was like, best thing ever. And I was like, and I didn't do, I didn't want to do it just for that. I was like, I want to do it for the right reasons too, you know? So the next season comes around and that things got better, you know, as far as that argument and things, you know, the next season she, uh, she's like, you know what? I, I don't feel right about telling you what to do. Um, and we've kind of made a, you know, eat, eat, you know, obviously eat what you shoot, and, you know, had some things and, and that was that. And I'd, I'd hunted ever since, but she needed to know that, that she was more important than that, I think. And once she did, she kind of let it go. Um, so, um, but yeah, we, and then the, the next thing I thought was going to be kids. Okay. I'm going to take my five-year-old boy deer hunting and she is not going to like it. And I'm like, I was like dreading coming to this, you know, it had not been an issue at all. So what was, awesome. was, I know, I can't believe it. Like it's unbelievable. And like, so I'll take the boys now 
both of them on a weekend to the hunt camp. And what she's realized is she gets alone time to do her garden, to do her clean the house, whatever. And it's, it's a great trade off. So, <laughs> but well, yeah, has no, Carrie, it's... has, has she, was she vegan when y'all met or has that, has that progressed through y'all's marriage? Uh, she vegan, vegetarian. Yeah. Kinda, yeah. So, yeah. but she loves to, I mean, she loves to garden. She's, you know, she was in the garden this morning and she's growing everything right now. And so she loves growing all that stuff. And then I, I like to shoot most of what I eat. So I'll do, yeah. you know you know all that stuff but yeah uh, well it's cool yeah it's 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 cool you shared that story you know two years into marriage because i think so often you know so much friction can happen with with things that just don't get communicated and and just kind of unresolved because you know even if um you hunted that year like you would still you know there's still this underlying guilt of you leaving your wife to go do something knowing that she hates like knowing that she does not like you doing right so it's like you can't even go enjoy it because you're like, you're just exactly. so in your head of like, well, uh, if I'm out here for the weekend or whatever, you just know that, you know, your wife is like, she's not happy about you going to do that. But, mm-hmm. you know, seeing y'all communicate that and 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 do that, it's it's, it's really powerful because I think so often in, in marriages, even in relationships, you know, if you don't address things that bother you, you're things are just going to keep festering and then it's just going to end up being an explosion one day instead of communicating it early on, you know, because if you, if, um, you know, y'all never communicated that and the next year you didn't take off the hunting season, it could have just been one day you came back and she just was so, was so mad at you. And then you feel, you know, guilty for going to do something that you love doing. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a real, I I feel, I feel like that now. Say it is, say it never puts that stuff on me, but I feel you know, if I go on a trip or something and I leave her home with the kids, I just like that sense of guilt of, you know, leaving my family, even though say that's never, that's never anything she's put on me. You know, you still feel like that. And I, and I'm sure it's even all the more going to do something that you know, that your wife isn't the biggest, isn't the biggest fan of. Oh, she's praying against me, not shooting everything every minute I was gone. But, but I'll honestly, I, it was, I remember having this conversation with Tim and he, he, it was cause good counsel. He's like, this is, I, I think this is probably what you need to do. And I was like, well, all right. And I remember ma- you know, being made fun of by some of my buddies. They're like, you're going to let her tell you or dictate if you're going to hunt or not. He's like, you like, you are a hunter. Like that's how God made you. Yeah, you your know? last name is like, Fisher. Yeah. But yeah. I'm a hunter. I like to fish yeah. too. But, but I remember my, some of my buddies are like, what are you doing? Like she's running your show. But it was like, we're not, you know, we're playing, you know, she just needed to know basically that she was more important than that, you know, um, yeah. which is, you know, just learned a lot through it. And God kind of, I guess God, God really honored that, you know, in the long run, I look back, I'm like, man, at one point I was like, how in the world is this going to go me being a hunter and her, you know, but God worked it all out way better than I could ever imagine for sure. Do you feel like. Cause I mean, I can imagine, you know, if people would have said that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about myself. I think at times that could have made me be insecure about something or, or be like, yeah, you know what, you know what, you know, sh- I'm not going to let her run the show or whatever. How do you, how do you kind of combat <laughs> comments like that, but also still being confident in your role as, as, as a husband? Well, I mean, it's just kind of, it's a pride thing, you know, that I, I still deal with stuff like that all the time. And, um, just working through that and trying to be confident and do the right thing because that's what I feel like God's leading me. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, ultimately that's the most important. So, yeah. Well, you've kind of compared, um, you know, the hunting cabin to a locker room, um, playing hockey, which is, which is really cool. Cause I'd, you know, I played baseball throughout high school. I, I didn't play past that. So I don't have much of a professional experience. Um, of a sport, but yeah, just the camaraderie that you have with things. I mean, I know for me, you know, the more I get to hang out with, um, you know, guys and people that really pour into me, the, the more, uh, beneficial that is for my marriage and also for, you know, just being a dad. So for you, how do you feel like having that time with, you know, guys that you're close with going, whether it's on a retreat, you just said that you were, you just got back from either Montana or Wyoming. Um, how do you feel like, you know, those moments where you're with guys that you do life with and, you know, just you're with your, <clears throat> you're with 
you know, the dudes, how do you feel like that impacts your role as a, as a dad and as a um, husband? I mean, it's huge. I, I, we have a Bible study group that we meet. We all have young kids, same age. We're all dealing with same thing. I remember when we we're going through our, our miscarriage time, there was, I think, 12 within a two year period of our group that had 12 wow. miscarriages. So we were walking through life together, you know, and yeah. that's how, that's, that's the, what it's supposed to be praying together. Um, you know, marriage stuff that always comes up, you know, working through that stuff with other guys that are, you know, um, but it takes, you know, it takes a vulnerability too, you know, and, you know, having people that are safe around you and, um, you know, I started meet with a buddy who's, um, been a pastor for a lot of this past year and he's, you know, helping me through, um, emotion stuff that I'd never dealt with before. I'd never want to talk about emotions. I don't know if you've heard, if you read the book, um, by Chip Dodd, uh, voice of the heart. Um, so I did a group, uh, with that and that, that was like, holy cow. I didn't know how, you know, as guys, I didn't know anything about emotions, but I have a really emotional eight year old. That's amazing kid, but he's highly emotional, which is teaching my wife and I how to deal with, you know, emotions and, they're not bad. That's, you know, so, um, I mean, I, I, I'm learning, you know, but I want to be around those people. Uh, you know, I want to be around people that are wiser than me. Um, I mean, I'll be the smartest guy, but I, I want to be around wise people. And because we take on the character of, of people, you know, as we're, the more time we spend with the Lord, the more we're going to take on you know, Christ-like character. If And the more we're around people of high character and integrity, the more we're going to take on those things. And that's, you know, that's why in the locker room, it's hard if you're the only, you know, Christian or voice or because there's all these influences, you know, that's why we need people, but we need strong, godly people around us. And to talk about, like, I never used to like to talk about anything, even in my marriage, if we're struggling, it's, you try to keep it in, and then it gets worse. And, you know, but if we're not talking about everything or if my wife doesn't know everything that's going on with me, then it's going to be real hard, you know? So, you know, that's, that's why we're created for community and um, that's helped. I mean, our, our community here in our church and is amazing. I mean, it really is. I'm grateful for, I look back and I kind of laugh because of the people that God's put in my life. I'm like, I'd be a mess without those people for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Someone asked me this, it was, it was, I think it was like two years ago, but this idea of how do you, you know, what's one of the best traits of, of, um, <clears throat> of like being a leader. And I was just thinking of, you know, humility and vulnerability of just, you know, admitting when you mess up and, um, and if you mess up and no one knows about it, being vulnerable enough to, um, to really share that. And even just hearing you, you know, speak on vulnerability. And when I met you in Jackson Hole, um, you know, you just would have never known that you were, you know, super famous or well known. You just you don't have an ego. You're you're, you're super humble, um, and I think those are two best traits that a leader can have. You know, and there's all there's there are so many other things of, you know, strong and courageous and whatever. But I still just don't think if you, I still just think if you don't have, you know, humility and vulnerability, I don't, I don't think you can be a good leader. If I don't think you can, you know, own your mistakes, and I don't think that people. Um, you know, if, if you try to just muscle through everything and, and, and you never really take time to to assess things that, that you're going through, then I just don't know how you can be emotionally healthy to, to be a leader, whatever. So whether that's, you know, a company, a business, or, uh, you know, leading your family, leading your wife, I think that those two things are huge. And, and you know, just knowing more about you and your story, I think um, those are two key characteristics of um, of your life. And it's really cool of you know, being someone of influence, being someone that, um, you know, like you said, is in the spotlight, but yet also be remaining uh, humble and having humility and exercising vulnerability and things that you're going with. How do you, um, you know, I I think I know what the answer is. I think it's going to be the Lord. Um, but how do you feel like, you know, being in the spotlight, being someone that is well known, how do you, you know, how do you remain so humble? Because it is easy to listen to opinions from from the outside world and, you know, negative media and, and, yeah, um, and all those different things. Well, I mean, both of us really, like we do live in a spotlight, obviously her a lot more than me, but we love to be at home. I, I, I mean, I, 
we have never really craved that. Um, she likes to garden and be at home. She's a homebody as much as she travels. But um, I guess we've just never, you know, we try. I mean, we we like living a simple life too, of just being around family and going to church and, um, you know, like most people. So I guess I feel like we're not, I know we have a, it's a little different, but, um, but we, we really, I, I would say obviously it's God working in my life. I don't know why I've said this. I don't know where I'd be without the Lord, you know, just knowing, you know, um, but, the right he's put so many good people around us at the right times to encourage us and um in our community around us now and without that i mean that i don't know how i really would deal with it so um but like i like made mistakes and i've learned a lot i've learned you know growing up it's interesting an athlete i've learned this really in the last year you know my life as an athlete's about performance right it's about you know earning and um performing and 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 I felt like my whole life was kind of like that a little bit as far as trying to be a good Christian, do you know, check the boxes, do all these mm-hmm. things, you know. And I realized that I think my sports has kind of influenced how I accept God's love, feeling like I got to earn it, feeling like I got to do something um, and trying to perform even inside marriage, check the boxes of all these things, you know. But uh, when it's really in those things, it's it's a heart level of connecting with the Lord, trying to be more like him, connecting with your wife. And, um, so yeah, it's, you know, definitely still learning and still have a lot to learn, but, um, but God's, you know, God's, he's, he's been faithful for sure. And I'm, I'm grateful for the people he's put in my life to, to help me for sure. Yeah. I re- I relate to that so much cause I'm super, I'm just such a competitive person and, and, you know, you 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 cannot take competition into marriage because I'm I can get so butthurt if I'm like you know if I keep a score or thing or something like that if like if I've done seven amazing things today I whatever I if I think that they're amazing if I've done seven good things and maybe they don't get noticed but then I do one I slip up and I don't do something then that's the one that gets hit on you know then I'm more like well you know the score is still seven to one here you know I've still I've still done, you know, more more servant like things for our family today than maybe I haven't. But you know, the one that gets nitpicked, I can be super, um, you know, just it can just crush me. It can it can it can make me just be super, uh, you know, upset because you know it's 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 like you said, it's how do you, you know, if your whole life has been about, you know, performing well and 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 kind of checking a box, like you said, how do you try to get out of that mindset, um, you know? in your marriage because not only can you compete with yourself in that, but then you can also, you know, direct that towards your wife of like, I've done X, Y, and Z today and you haven't done anything. And then, you know, it can stuff like that. Just, it's just a slippery slope. It's just a ripple effect of, and then they ask you to do something. Then you're like, you know what? No, I've done, you know, how about, how how about you do something, which isn't what is, it isn't what's maybe verbally said, but it's the thought that you could have of like, you know, and then, um, you know, a, a few weeks ago, Sadie asked me to do something. And I was like, um, what did I say? I was like, uh, I was like, yep. Okay. But it was like the tone I said it in, you know, <laughs> because things had been festering of, of like, you know, a little annoyance or whatever. And then she was like, why'd you say it like that? And I was like, say it like what? And she was like, like that. And I was like, just whatever. And then she was like, why are you saying whatever? So it's like, <laughs> if you don't address those little things from, you yeah. know, from a competing standpoint, um, it really just is unhealthy and it's, and it's honestly miserable, you know, cause you can't keep score in marriage and it, it, it is a team sport and how do you encourage one another? Um, but yeah, I relate to that so much, just the performance aspects. I'm such a competitive person and yeah, it, it does not work in a marriage. No, no, we got, we got into a similar one last week. Well, we've actually been around each other a lot in the last few weeks and we realized that that was maybe part of it, you know, but I mean, you know, I, the key, what I'm learning, even inside, you know, being a dad is like, I got to get comfortable saying sorry, you know, like that's really important to apologize, ask for forgiveness. You know, that's something that Carrie and I have gotten, I would say a lot better at, you know, that's, we weren't great at it for a while, you know, and that just, you got to get really comfortable saying sorry and owning it. And, um, even inside being a dad, like the most important, I heard something recently, it said that, you know, it's not the, you know, the foul that's most important or whatever you did 
the, you know, um, but it's it's the uh, reconciliation that's most important. So if you, if you if you did something you shouldn't have done, you yelled or got upset or whatever, as a dad, it's like the most important thing is not that, it's reconciliation. Make it right. Ask for forgiveness. Pray together. Whatever it is, you know? And because, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to apologize to your kid too, but it's very, very important. But that's so good, man. Well, I, I want to um, I want to end today with allowing you to have um, the space and the platform to let people listening know if you have um, any new music coming out anytime soon, or if you uh, if you plan on releasing any singles, and um, you know, maybe may, maybe whoever's listening, even to help you, maybe go through one of Carrie's songs and maybe see how you can tweak tweak one of the titles and maybe kind of run with it. Yeah, I mean, I you know what? I got out of the music thing. I had two hits. And I was like, man, I got to just end there. <laughs> you're, you're, you're batting <laughs> and, uh, a thousand. No, thank goodness. I don't. My brother came out with an alter ego named Rut Daniels. So now he's got all the all the video stuff. So I, I got out of it. Thank goodness. I don't oh, do funny. any more music videos. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you could be like like yeah. Duke Hunter or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, that's funny. Yeah. So, awesome, man. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm really I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the songs and, and, and see if I can help. Uh, See if I can help 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 you out with something. Yeah, I'll do it for sure. I'll we'll see what I can do. <laughs> Mike, man, well, thank you so yeah. much, man. You're um just like I said earlier, your your humility and your vulnerability just really speak through um, you know, everything that everything that, that you're doing now, everything that you've done. Um it's just really it's it's really cool to see um, you know, you and Carrie live out your faith and just see you be um you know, owning mistakes that you've made as a father and as a husband. I think that's really cool for, for people listening of, um, you know, how can you be a man, but also a man that, you know, it's not all about strength and all these things. It's how do you be a servant and how do you, you know, love your family and how do you serve your wife? And, uh, you're doing that really well. And, uh, I'm thankful to, to, uh, to know you and, uh, hope to get, hope to get you, hope to get to know you better in the future, man. And I'm just thankful that you were able to join us today. And, uh, give us some wisdom that you shared well thank you i appreciate you having me and um yeah i love what you're doing and uh maybe we get to the hunt camp here one of these days so man i would yeah. love that i would love that right. we can um we, we can we can write a song together there you go Deal. awesome and we and, and we can and we can shoot <laughs> yeah. some deer and send it send it send a picture to our wives there you go <laughs> awesome yeah. man well thank All you right. so much mike this was great thanks buddy appreciate it